Hey everyone, in today's video I'm going to share with you how I organize everything in Obsidian. This is the end of a long journey that started almost a year ago when I first published Rethinking My PKM 1. And since then I've been releasing various videos on the topic and now I'm ready to share how my entire system works. So in today's video, we are going to look at the six principles of my PKM and the 14 components of my system. And for each of them, each of the components, I'm going to try to give you multiple examples from my vault. Also, the drawing that I'm going to use in today's video, I'm going to include a link in the video description to this Excolidraw drawing. So you can open this and you will find lots of additional information, links to various videos that I've shared and links to blog posts and other materials. So you can really dive into the topic that interests you the most. Just a quick reminder, the Visual Thinking Workshop Cohort 4 is starting this Saturday. If you're interested to learn more about visual thinking, if you want to learn from me about organizing your information in Obsidian, this is an awesome opportunity to meet with me and to work together. I'd love you to join cohort four. So now let's dive in and let's start with the six principles. So my first principle is to keep it simple. Each component, each of the 14 components has a clear purpose and a single purpose. And I try to keep these separate from one another so I don't get confused about it. Second, I'm keen on minimizing friction. I use two primary tools for this, Templater and Data View. But of course, there are some other automations as well but automation is an important part of my workflow. Third, I live in a brownfield reality and I bet most of you also. This means that I've had previous PKM systems where I stored information. I had my file system, so I, every time I upgrade my PC, I store the previous PC's content in a folder called archive. So this is archive in an archive in an archive in an archive going back to the 1990s. So there's lots of stuff. Also, I use multiple tools like the brain, Evernote, Rome research, etc. And I've imported materials from there. But this means that overall, my vault is a mess. I try to get on top of the categories or the tags or the folders, but it is really hard with this brownfield reality. And I decided to accept reality for what it is. Fourth, I'm keen on avoiding moving files around. I make this point because Tiago Forte in Building a Second Brain proposes a workflow where you move files into a folder for the project. And when the project completes, move your files to somewhere else. I don't like to move files around because then links break. Even in Obsidian, where you get some control around it, there are some issues with moving files around. So I place a file somewhere and I stick to that location even if it sometimes means that things don't end up in their co correct folders. Fifth, I apply LATCH. LATCH stands for Location, Alphabet, Time, Category, and Hierarchy. And this was coined by Richard Worman. He is the founder of TED Talks. And he said that everything in the world can be organized by these five means and by these five means only. And the way I apply latch or the reason I apply latch is to maximize the ways how I can find information. So I can find information based on my calendar. I can find information based on the physical location. If it was for some reason memorable, I can find it based on categories and with the other methods as well using latch and applying latch to each pieces of information in my vault helps me maximize findability. And finally, 
I always link. Now, this is something that I've not been always deliberate on. I looked at how many orphan files I have in my vault and I was surprised to see that it was in the high hundreds, meaning five, six hundred orphan files. And this is because often I'm using folders in a way that they provide a structure and often I just simply place a document with the topic in that file. But of course, that reduces findability. So recently I've decided that I'm only going to place files in my vault if I'm able to link it to somewhere to my graph. So these are my principles. And then let's dive into each of the tools. I'm going to start with folders. And first of all, you can see my folder hierarchy here. It is a relatively lean folder hierarchy. So you can see I have, these are my folders. There are some folders that I would love to get rid of, but because I don't want to move files and because of the brownfield reality, I cannot. So Archive the Brain is there. It has lots and lots of files where you can see there it has almost 4,500 files and a thousand subfolders. So that is a big mess. But also hobbies, I would love to move under projects. But again, lots of files here, lots of folders. And I just decided to leave it where it is. By the way, I think of folders not as physical storage locations, but as namespaces. So let me show you what I mean by that. So when I create a new link to a file that doesn't exist in my vault. Let's imagine I'm adding a new book to my vault and I want to add the author. I don't just write the name of the author, for example, Dan Rome, but I create the author in the people authors namespace, which simply means that I type in and here in search, we can actually take a look at this. So. I type in a link that starts with people, then slash author, and then slash I continue with the name of the author. So in this case, you can see I have a number of ghost links. So ghost link means that the actual folder for the author has not been created. So you can see here Dan Rome or Eliezer Yudkovsky. You can see here a couple of Hungarian poets, as well as some other authors. By doing this, when I create the file or when I create the link to the name of the person, I can already give it a type. I know it's an author, even without creating the file and adding a tag author. To me, this is helpful. Second, I like folders because they help me manage what gets synchronized with Obsidian Sync. So here in Obsidian Sync settings, you can actually uh, specify exclude folders. So here on my Mac, I have nothing. All my videos are on my desktop PC. It, uh, there I have lots of folders that are in the exclude because, for example, I exclude all the folders with the video files and voice files because they are large and there is no point in synchronizing them. However, I keep them in Obsidian, but I can ring fence that content and not move it around with Obsidian Sync. Then. I try to name YouTube project files and other files as well, or rather folders with a year, month, date naming. This is something new that I've started, so I don't really have many examples of this, but here you will see that some of the folders that are now created recently follow this naming convention. What this helps me with is it gives me a chronological order for my videos because you can see I have a whole bunch of files here and sometimes it is a bit of a difficult uh, thing to find the video. However, I do remember the time when I created that video. 
And then in Obsidian, you can set up the attachments folder and also the new files. So here, if I come to settings under files and links, there are these additional uh, settings that you can create. So first of all, the default location for new notes for me is the same folder as the current file, which means that if I'm working on a topic and I just simply write the name of a new file, not using the namespace, then that file is going to be created in the same folder. If I want to place it somewhere else, then I follow this namespace approach and I type out the location of the file. And second, I keep my attachments under the subfolder of the topic. For me, attachments and the notes are very closely connected and this is why for me this makes sense. So for example here if I come to input this is where all my inputs are for example articles and assessments and books and conferences films uh, if here's for example my book notes on deep work and you can see here that i have my attachments folder which includes all of my illustrations for deep work so that's about folders now moving on to tags I only use one tag per page. There's one exception to this, which is more a stylistic thing, and I didn't even include it here, but you will see it in the next step when I talk about data view and how I'm using search. So for now, the point is I aim to give a single tag to each document and that will give that document a type. So for example, if we open this page and I'm going to navigate here. If I open this page, you can see that this is a map of content and you can see I have my tag map of content here. And now if I open Excalibrain, for this page, then what you will see here is based on the tag on the page, I'm going to give this file a different look and feel in Excalibrain. So all my map of contents are with this uh, red color and have this icon of a map there. All my people files, so you can see a couple of people here, Tiago Fort and Nick Milo, or have this person uh, at the beginning. All my books have this book there. Then I have Excolidro drawings, have this painter's uh, palette there, etc. So I use the tag for the page to also define the look and feel of this page in Excolibrain. And just to show you how I configure this in Excolibrain, so here, if I come to Excolibrain settings, I can scroll down here. Here are all the different tags listed that I'm using in my vault with a special purpose. And here, if I choose one of the tags, so let's look at the MOC that we looked at a second ago, you can see that I have my prefix, which is this map emoji and then I have the background color and the text color specified and I can see that this is how these are going to look. And for example, if I look at a person, then you can see that this is how a person node looks like in Excolibrain. I need to add these tags here and then they appear here in the list. And finally on tags, I have this article and on the link that I'm going to include in the show notes that will take you to excolidraw.com with this drawing there. You will find this link and you can click on this. So back in the time when I was working in the brain, I had this whole color scheme of how I used the different thought types. And these are actually the equivalents of tags or the way I use them in Obsidian. And I had different 
color ranges. So red range were all the media that I consumed. The yellow range was, for example, all the people, friends, family, colleagues. All these purple items were companies or legal entities, etc. So each color had its own purpose. And when I looked at my graph, then I was able to understand it immediately or understand it much better. So moving on, talking about links. So we're going to look back to my PKM MOC and you will see how I'm using links here. So or the ontology. So the ontology is defined here in the front by this data view field with double columns after it. And then I have the link. The way this is going to appear on the graph in Excolibrain is here. If you take a look, you will see that these tags that are here on the left hand side appear here as related to examples, um, example, examples, etc. author, you have the different type of relationship. So I use ontology in my vault and I use it to describe the relationship between this file and the next file. To me, this helps to think about why I have that link there. It what's the purpose of the link actually coming up with the ontology is sometimes a challenge in Excolibrain. There's a feature that I get prompted with these ontologies. So if I type triple double colon, then this list comes up and I can just simply type and we'll get all the different type of ontologies I have defined. And each of these has a definition in Excolibrain, whether they're a parent, a child or a friend. So again, here in Excolibrain, you can see that these are all the fields that are parents or children and friends. I have some excluded ontologies which are there for some other technical reasons. And I have also a couple of unregistered ones that I either still need to register to make it explicit in Excolibrain or they're just there because over time these were created. Anyway, so this trigger, or oh, and let me just show you this so you can see here, you have the ontology suggester is something you can turn on and then using these features, these hot combinations, the suggester comes up. So if I only want to see friend relationships, then these are all the type of ontologies I can apply here that will create a lateral link in Excolibrain for me. So the lateral link, just to show you that as well, will look like this. So everything here, the central idea is the document I have open and everything on the left hand side are lateral links. These are parent links and these are children nodes. So that's the logic. And I use the ontology to specify where each item gets on my graph. Linking also includes embedding items into the Excolidro storyboards. So again, let me just show you how this storyboard looks like. So the document we are looking at right now. So again, I'm going to open Excolibrain. And now in the center, you can see that this is the file we are looking at. So this is my PKM design tags, links folder, ontology, MOC, Zettelkast, etc. And you can see that all of these items that are embedded here are also present here. So for example, here, I have this uh, calendar icon that's embedded. I'm not going to navigate to this because that will take us off on a tangent, but you can see already that this icon is actually used in four other places. So it's used in five places. So already with this, I'm making a connection to somewhere else where I talked about time and calendaring, etc. But so for me, when I embed 
an object into my X call it raw storyboard for a topic, then that already will create a link. And on the ontology, we already talked about the ontology uh, bit, so we are going to take this topic off as well. The ontology describes the relationship between nodes and I differentiate between parent, child and lateral connections. I implement it with data view fields and I visualize it with Excalibrain. Here's a video where I talk about this uh, in more detail. Then the next important element of my organization system is I'm trying to work with atomic nodes and use transclusion. So for example, as just I mentioned with the calendar item, and maybe we can, we can actually navigate to that calendar to see where else we are using the calendar. So by reusing, or maybe here's the check mark and we're going to navigate to this. By, if I click here, this will open the check mark. And here I can come to the various documents. So for example, evaluating evidence, this is actually a part of my book on a page for the book Rationality. So here I'm using exactly the same check mark and using the same check mark, I can navigate to the topic. Sometimes these links are irrelevant. Oftentimes this comes as an interesting surprise that yeah that that visual link that I reuse it also provides a contextual linking so that's about atomic nodes I also use this the construction of images there are two videos here I'm not going to go into this because this is a big rabbit hole that goes down into this hole how I deconstruct Excolidraw drawings into sub drawings, but this is a very important part of my whole methodology of reusing components, not redrawing and using these components to create links. But also I try to do this by creating consistent sections in my other notes as well. So here are two examples. Here's an example of an article and you will see that the article has a summary section. And by the way, if you look at my book notes, then the book note also has a summary section. By way of having this commonality, I know that if I'm referencing a book, I can immediately write hashtag summary and just get the summary embedded into the location. So if I transclude this, so let's say I open uh, today's daily note and I want to transclude building a second brain summary. So then I would write building a second brain like this and I would immediately write hashtag summary. And with this, I'm able to embed this here. And I would also probably add a reference here. So in this case, the reason I'm putting this here is because this is an example. So I would add my ontology like this, but by having this consistent approach of always calling the summary summary, this just simplifies my life because with this consistency, I can easily embed items and reference them. The same with quotes. Don't ask me why I ended up with P, but every quote that I have. So for example, here's the daily quote from today. If I look here in Markdown, then you will see that here I have this quote from Napoleon Hill. And here I have this reference with P. And again, I know that if there's a quote, a single quote in a file that is worth referencing, then it's going to have a block reference P. And that just helps me easily find these uh, items in my vault.
this file, this example book is a good example for section headings. So there is a trade-off between embedding files and in reference or, or creating larger files. So if I look at building a second brain, you can see here that I have a couple of notes here and these notes are just simply typed here. So uh, I'm, I'm not embedding anything here. In this case, I made some notes about the book, some of my research as I was reading the book. And here under notes, I simply added these items and that's all. But for example, if I would open another book, I'm going to open, for example, Emergence. So if I open Emergence, then here you will see that I had a bit more content here. And in this case, I included or transcluded content here. And some of them, I only transcluded the summary. Uh, in other cases, I uh, transcluded the whole material. But in these cases, the files actually live in their proper location. So this file lives here in its input folder under YouTube. So this is the input YouTube folder. That's where the file is. And here, it's a block reference so you can see this as a block reference so that's the trade-off if i have lots of files or lots of notes that i want to include then i start to break them out into their relevant files and i make them embeds that have a link if i don't have that many i typically start by typing these topics here and then break them out later if I feel that that is required. So moving on, let's move up to the top here. So file names, I have a couple of file name conventions which I find pretty helpful. All my MOCs start with an underscore like you can see here. So let's just show you some of the other MOCs if I come to Excalibrain and I think with that we can also cover MOC. So here these are the various map of contents in my vault. You can see uh, these right here and you can see that each of them have the same file name. But similarly I have naming conventions. So for example book cover will bring up all the book covers I have in my vault or if I type in logo then this will bring all the logo images if I type icon then it will show all the icons in my vault I also use this I have some automations around it I'm going to include that uh, link here as well so here if I open the image library so it's here, I also have a logo library. So maybe let's open the logo library. Then this will show me all the logos in my vault. So all of these files will start with the word logo. So there's my, you can see my Apple logo here. If I press control O and type logo, Apple logo, then you can see that indeed, that Apple logo is right there. Also in my naming convention, you can see that at the end, uh, in this case and in most of the cases, my file name has three parts. It specifies the type of file. So is it a book cover, a logo, an illustration, a photo, an icon, a whatever. Then there's the actual keywords that define the file. So in this case, it's Apple logo, but for example, if I open my image library, then you will see that I have longer file names in my image library. So these are all the icons in my vault. And here you can see that you see the headache, frustration, anger are the keywords. And then the final part of the naming convention you will see here as well is the source of the file. So in this case, it's a flat icon. 
but if the source is something else, then it's going to be that other source. So these are the various namings. So you can see here book cover, illustration, thumbnail, book on a page uh, starts with a BOP, literature note starts with LN, etc. And the date format I use is year, year, month, month, day, day, because that consistent naming helps me find stuff easier. Then I use templates and I have lots of templates. So here, if I open my template folder, templater templates, so you can see I have a whole bunch of templates. I actually follow again the naming convention here as well. So I have templates that create a new line. So it just creates a single line in the document and I have templates that create new pages and I have some other templates as well. For many of the things I do, I use these templates and then some of my templates actually automate the process of creating folders and multiple files. So if there's a more complex activity, then I use that. So for example, the YouTube workflow video that I explain here will show you a case study where I have a template that creates files and folders and places stuff all the places and the Xcolidro templates shows you different ways how you can create graphical templates maybe pre-filled templates for various tasks so templates are an important part uh, of my setup we already talked about ontology and frankly, we already looked at the maps of content as well. Here's another map of content just as an example. So this is my map of content about sketchnoting. Again, you can see here all the different ontologies and links. You can see lots of uh, material here. So this is uh, my map of content for sketchnoting and I have a good number of map of contents to summarize various topics uh, that I'm working on. And some of these, so for example here, this map of content also has uh, some visual summaries as well. So for example, this is a summary about some uh, sketchnoting, listing some sketchnoters, some YouTube channels, some books, and uh, some stuff about visual vocabulary, etc. Then moving on, the way I use daily notes is I use daily notes to create the time hierarchy based on latch. So this is the time aspect, and then we're going to talk about geotags, and that's going to be the location aspect of organizing information. So if you look at this holiday last year, June, we went to Rome with my wife. Uh, what I want to show you here is here, if I click to, first I need to open here the right hand side. So we have the map here uh, with all sorts of different locations. And here, if I open this to show this on the map, then you can see that this has actually a location here and you can also see the other components of our uh, visit, uh, the tickets to Vatican City and to the Colosseum. And then just going further on here, here's earlier this year we went to Sicily and we visited the, the Valley of the Temples and the Turkish Stairs as well as moved around here we went to Etna as well so here's the family on Etna and and so this is I think a very useful way to organize information I'm using the map view plugin so this is the map view plugin right here this is the settings for that I find this very practical you can add geotags so this is here a geotag if i click here then you will see that this is a geotag based actually in this case a lat long 
coordinates, but this can also be an address depending on the type of link we are talking about. You can also see that I'm using the check-in, check-out inline ontology here. So the way this looks in Excali Brain, and that's where we come back to the daily note linkage. So if now again I open Excali Brain, then you will see that our vacation in Rome is linked to these days. So this is when we were in Rome. You can also see uh, we were in Vatican City and the Colosseum, uh, and you can see some other information here as well. But the point is, by adding check-in and check-out, I can know when we arrived and when we left. And by linking all of these events to the daily note, through the daily note, I can navigate my history and I can look at what happened on that day. I'm not going to open the daily note because that typically contains some personal information as well that I don't want to share. But so the idea is these daily notes you can see here are linked to one another with the tomorrow link. And so this creates this chain of days and each day I'm linking of what is happening on that day. Maybe to show you just one more example, if we come to uh, this page right here, then this page is linked to today's date right there. And this is when I'm working on it. You can also see that this is linked to a couple of days ago as well when I also worked on this. So I know on what which days I worked on this specific material. So that actually covers daily notes as my time hierarchy and geotags. Now, I like to see tasks in the context where I need to talk about them. In my normal work, I have many projects happening in my organization and I deal with lots of people. So in each situation, I want to be reminded of the actions that we discussed with that person or with that vendor or with that project the last time we met. And I talk about this and how I do this in It's About Time. So you can look at this video. But I want to show you how this looks in my demo vault. So this is going to be an example just to show you very quickly how this works. So for example, this is my note about Bob the Builder and the video I'm referencing goes into more details about this and walks you through how this works. But you can see here that when I am on the page for Bob the Builder, I'm immediately cognizant that there is a topic where I'm waiting for Bob. Actually, it is related to Project K. And this right here is a data view query. It's an extremely simple data view query. Uh, I explain everything about it in the video. The point I want to show you here is I'm placing this information on the page of the person. And whenever I'm meeting with someone or talking about a project or whatever other topic, I always open the page for that person or project or topic. And most of my templates or pretty much all of my templates include the task section. Therefore, I always get the context relevant tasks in the context when I need it at the time that I need it. So for example, you can see here there's an action for Bob on a meeting to discuss something with Mock. And if I look at Mock's page, of course, I'm going to see all of these actions that are now for Mock the dump truck. And you will see that there's an action from the page Bob the Builder. And then there's another action that was somehow discussed on Rolly uh, or with Rolly the steamroller and then something from Project B. One quick side note that this is the other way I'm using tags and I only use it in this specific instance. So I have three tags. I have the waiting for, discuss with 
and promised to. So these are three tags I use. Frankly, I don't really search on them. I could actually categorize the data view query here based on promise to discuss with waiting for. And I had a period of time when I did that. I recognized that it didn't really matter that much. Right now, this is more for just stylistic reasons. For me, it is important to know that I noted something down because I need to talk about that with the person or that person has promised me something and I need to wait for that and follow it up. Or maybe I promised something to that person and I need to be cognizant of that when we meet so I can either share the results with the person or be proactive in apologizing that I haven't yet done it. but. The point is that I want to be reminded. So in this case, I'm also using tags, but here I'm not using it to define the type of the page, but I'm using it just as a stylistic component to remind me of the type of action that I'm talking about. This is also then covering the dynamic lists. So tasks are in the context when where I need them and I use data view fields. And then I'm using various dynamic lists. I'm using not only data view, but I also have embedded Obsidian queries as well. And finally, I have this diagnostics and maintenance page. And here I'm looking at stuff like orphan notes, which right now I, the absolute orphans are files that are just there. No one is pointing at them and it is not pointing to anyone. So they are completely alone in the dark. So I have 109 at the moment of these. And then, for example, I have this list of pasted images. So I like to name the images, either illustration or photo or whatever, wherever they came from. So sometimes I come here and clean up some of the pasted images that I didn't name. So I have the properly named images. So that summarizes how I organize information in Obsidian. It may be a lot, but to me, this structure helps put everything in place. The key component here is latch, making sure that I have multiple ways to find information either by location or alphabet time category or hierarchy. And then you could see the different tools and components that I'm using to achieve this. So that's all I wanted to share with you. Again, just a quick reminder, if you want to learn more, if you're interested in exploring visual thinking and exploring the use of Obsidian with me. Sign up to cohort four. You still have a couple of days to do that. I'm going to close registrations in a few days. So if you're interested, check out this page. And again, this whole mind map or visual summary that's here, I'll include in the show notes. You'll have a link and you can open this on xcollegeraw.com. And from there, you can either copy this into your own Obsidian or you can follow these links. So all around the page, you will see these YouTube links that take you to various videos that are relevant in the subject as well. Here you see this link to the article. So that's all I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for watching until the end and I hope to see you next time.